This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, and we greet you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We were having a few technical difficulties here this morning, so I'm not sure whether or not you are have tuned in live or if you'll be watching this later on a recorded version. But I thank God that you have joined us for another Level Up session. Let's have a word of prayer and then let's, let's dive in and let's level up. Lord God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, Father. I thank you for this day. I thank you for those that will be touched by this lesson. God, it's, it's, it's because you, we live, we move, and we have our being. And, and we have no doubt in our mind that someone's going to be blessed, someone's going to be edified, someone's going to be convicted and challenged by this word. So Lord, open our hearts. Touch us today as never before in Jesus' name. Amen and thank God. We're studying the course Abundant Living, and it's based on the book Life Overflowing by Bishop T.D. Jakes. And each week, before we actually get into the meat of the course, we like to add to make sure we know our true identity in Christ. There's this constant battle that goes on in the mind that tries to cause us not to believe, not to accept, not to realize who we are in Christ. And so today we're going to realize that we will be with Christ forever. And the scriptures teach us that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Ephesians 1, 10 and 11. And then secondly, we are marked as belonging to God by the Holy Spirit, in whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, Ephesians 1.13. So just let's make sure we have it now. We will be with Christ forever, and we are marked as belonging to God by the Holy Spirit. Today we're going to conclude our fourth pillar from the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 4, and this particular pillar is life overflowing. Those of you that have been with us through the course, you remember we started off being loved by God. That was pillar one, that we learned, that we understood, that we accepted that we are loved by God. And then in pillar two, we learned what it was to experience Jesus, to make it more than just a casual relationship, but to actually experience him. And then in pillar three, we became intimate with God. Hmm. Knowing him who my soul loves, yes. And now today we will continue with life overflowing. In our text, in this particular, uh, particular chapter, 
there are seven ways we were taught to walk. Last week we were, we were taught to walk responsibly in Christ Jesus. We were taught to walk as a new person in Christ Jesus. Taught to walk in strength. And then taught to walk in unity. This week we're going to deal with walking in the spirit walking in love and walking in wisdom and it bears repeating that each one of these walks uh, there's there's no way we can exhaust the walks in in one hour or a little better now easily easily as a matter of fact this first one walking in the spirit is something that we're doing in ministries Oh, I dare say every day, every week, that we're learning how to walk in the Spirit. But let's see, let's see what we can learn that Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus. And it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Ephesians 4.30. The word grieve here means to outrage and humiliate. Even though we were not able to dispose Jesus Christ, we are still capable of dethroning him from our hearts and turning our passions and zeal toward people or things that distract us from God's will and truth. We cannot take Jesus off the throne, but we can allow people and things to turn our hearts and our passion from his will and from his truth. Grieving the Holy Spirit is to say and do things that prohibit his participating in our lives to the extent he desires. The chief cause of grief to the Holy Spirit is walking in the lust of the flesh. See, we, we can do things that simply prohibit the, the, the flow of the Holy Spirit in our lives. I believe that the Holy Spirit, because it leads and guides us into all truth, it lets us know be, be, before, before, we, before we stop the Holy Spirit from having free access, it lets us know and it prevents his participating in our lives to the extent he desires. We can choose to sin and to engage in behaviors that are contrary to God's purposes. We said this in a previous lesson, for the born again believer, sin is Sinning is a choice. And we just need to let that, let that sink in. Let that sink in. Nothing makes us sin but ourselves. It's a choice. This does not mean that the Holy Spirit leaves us. The Holy Spirit never, according to Scripture, never leaves us or forsakes us. He sealed us unto the day of redemption. Here's what sealed means. It means to mark as a means of identification. It's the signet. Some of you have seen signet rings that have the family crest on it. Hmm. This mark denotes ownership and carries with it the protection of of the owner. But 
We can choose to sin. We can choose to sin. However, when we choose to sin, to follow the dictates of our own fleshly desires. See, I know this. I know. Oh, God, Lord, I thank you. We disconnect from the Holy Spirit's favor in our lives. We disconnect from him. He cannot manifest himself in anything that is contrary to the will and goodness of God. And, and, and this progression of disconnect, we, we see it getting greater and greater as we see the day of the second coming approaching. Once again, we can choose to follow our own dictates and our own fleshly desires. You remember the prodigal son. He said, Father, give me that which is mine. Give me my inheritance. And he went off into a foreign country. The father never left home. He was still the, the prodigal son's dad. But the son chose to disconnect himself from the father. John 15 chapter deals with the true vine. Get a chance, read it. Yes. And my father is the husband man. Get you out. We disconnect. The Holy Spirit will not help us. You ready? will not help us to lie or to avoid the consequences of lying. For You remember that, that for everything, there is a consequence. And we look, sometimes we look for the Holy Ghost to help us with the consequence of the lie. Lord, please, please don't let them find out that I lied. Please, please hide it. God says, no, 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 I can't help you to lie. See, we, the tendency, what, what, what the enemy tries to do is cause us to put God on our level. Uh, he will manifest himself only as we tell the truth. We must confess our lies and obtain forgiveness. See, we're talking about walking in the spirit. Something that, that needs to be shared with all teachers of the word of God. We do not have the option not to teach the entire scriptures. And let it convict us as teachers. Let it convict us. There may be other giftings and, and, and other areas of ministry that can pick and choose. And they say, well, I'm not living that, so I'm not going to preach that. That's, that's not the issue here. As a teacher of God's word, we have an obligation to teach the entire truth of God's word. And if it convicts us, we should rejoice in the fact that the Holy Ghost is still moving in our lives. Oh, let's continue. The Holy Spirit will not help us to cheat on another person or help us to avoid the consequences of getting caught. He will manifest himself when we seek to treat others honestly and make restitution to those we have cheated. Third thing, the Holy Spirit will not help us to seduce another person's spouse 
or help us to cover up the seduction or act of adultery. People, it, 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 the enemy is still using, and, and it, it just kind of amazes me, I guess. I, I, when I hear someone talk about someone else that's married, whether they be male or female, and they make the statement, he's going to be my husband. And you wonder, how, how is it, what is it that, that, that you've seen in the Holy Ghost that tells you that this married man or married woman is, is going to be your spouse? What, what, what is it? No, no, no. The Holy Spirit will not help us to seduce another person's spouse or help us cover that seduction or act of humility. He will help us resist the temptation to sin and or help us to terminate the illicit love affair. That's what the Holy Ghost is going to do. The Holy Ghost in James is going to tell us, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The Holy Spirit, our mind, our mind, that, that, that door that the enemy keeps trying to get in will tell us how difficult, how lonely we're going to be when we terminate that illicit affair. But the Holy Spirit says terminate it. Now, this morning, terminate it. It is the desire of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, to be on our side and giving us the information and the discernment that we need. In leading us into right directions and right actions. In giving us the inspiration and motivation to act religiously, righteously, and courageously. In giving us the inspiration and motivation to act, live righteously, and courageously. Because unless we're walking in the spirit, there are times when we do not to walk righteously but the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will be on our side in strengthening us to withstand evil and to speak and act in truth. Growth in Jesus Christ, manifestation of his fruit, and operating in his gifts, that's what the Holy Spirit wants. Growth in Jesus Christ, manifestation of his fruit, and operating in his gifts, that's what the Holy Spirit wants. Choosing to do things in our own way, acting against God's desires, grieves the Holy Spirit. Each morning when we wake up, we're asking God to forgive us, but then we're asking God, Lord, help me. Help me not to grieve the Holy Spirit. Help me to walk in the Spirit. Not a Spirit. No, no, no. Not just a Spirit. Help me to walk in the Spirit, capital S. There's six things that grieve the Holy Spirit scripturally. And here's the disclaimer. Here's the disclaimer. This is the word of God. 
It's not going to change. I shared with you last week, over the years, I have come across scriptures and closed the Bible, opened it back up, closed it again, opened it back up, and thought it would disappear. This will not disappear. None of his word will. Six things that grieve the Holy Spirit. Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, and malice. Ephesians 4.31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Let's continue. Let's look at this grieving the Holy Spirit. Because, because sometimes, sometimes we do it in ignorance. We'll take that, that road right now. Sometimes we do it in ignorance. But then there are other times we just don't care. We... we there used to be a saying, I had to put my Holy Ghost on the shelf. It's impossible to do. It's impossible to put your Holy Ghost on the shelf. But you can walk away from it. It is important to note that most things on the list can be held intentionally for a fairly long period of time without others knowing what's going on inside. Did you get that? How many of us are holding on to at least one of the six and we think nobody knows what's going on on the inside? Eventually, these vow wounds will make us offensive to the Holy Spirit. We were sent to serve. The way to grieve the Holy Spirit and destroy unity. Remember last week, walking in unity with our brothers and sisters in the body. The way to grieve the Holy Spirit and destroy unity is to operate in these six things. The way to please him and preserve unity is to avoid these six things at all costs. Hmm. Let's look at the six. Bitterness can live with us for years. Eventually, it's going to leak out. It manifests in acid remarks that corrode relationships, weakens the metal of peace, and can ultimately cause depression or illness. It is going to manifest itself in unforgiveness. Bitterness. Live for years. There, some of our brothers and sisters, and the Lord is sending deliverance this morning. The Lord is sending deliverance this morning. Have lived in bitterness for years. And along with bitterness, the author tells us, can ultimately cause depression or illness. We, we're just bitter. Forgive and it shall be forgiven. Luke 6, 37. We, we love this passage of scripture because it says, give, give, and it shall be given to you. Press down, shake it together. Ready? We love Luke 6, 36, but it's 6, 37 that says, forgive, and it shall be forgiven you. The second is wrath. Wrath is rooted in the spirit of revenge. 
a strong desire to get even, to destroy one's enemy, whether they're real or imaginary, to advance one's own personal power and position. A person can plot revenge for years and never act on it. Wow. That's wrath. For years. Bitterness can live in us for years. How can you go about plotting revenge year after year? A strong desire to destroy one's enemy. Whether that's real, sometimes it's imaginary. And it's to advance our own personal power or position. But the scripture says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord, Romans 12, 19. And I pray you're writing down these verses of scripture. Because this is what we have to use to come against Satan. Let's continue. Ah. Anger. Anger grieves the Holy Spirit. Anger is rooted in the desire for power. Being denied something that we want or think we deserve. When feeling this acute sense of losing control over a situation, we lash out and become abusive. We have to understand that those who abuse are not acting out of hatred. They're acting out of a desire to show or regain power. And, and, and we know the scripture, right? Be ye angry and sin not. And here's what happens. Here's what happens when that anger takes root. We have a desire for power. And we become abusive. So you see, as, as we mentioned before, it, it's more than physical abuse. It's, it's more than mental abuse. It's more than verbal abuse. Yes. Yeah. And, and we can become abusive in any or all of those situations because of this desire for power. Most anger is rooted in selfishness. And it is dangerous for us to justify it or to rationalize it. It is dangerous for us to justify it, justify being abusive. Justify, ju rationalize being abusive. It's dangerous. Because it's rooted in selfishness. If we allow anger to fester, eventually it will manifest in an unrighteous, unholy way. We will lash, gash, crash, rather than seek out a solution that is strong and effective and righteous. That's the solution. The solution should be effective and righteous. When anger boils over, it burns and destroys. The body of Christ needs to empty itself of personal lust so he can fill us to overflowing with God's power. I remember a young lady who, who told her testimony was that she used to get so angry that she, that she really couldn't see 
couldn't make out the images of who she was angry with, what was going on. Just that angry. Hmm. And what's the root? Selfishness. Clamor, six things. Yeah, six things. Clamor is to make noise or to shout in a way that's disruptive. We're grieving the Holy Spirit and we're... And and our objective is to walk in the spirit. It's rooted in a general restlessness. Oh, God. Because something is perceived to be missing or lacking. A person clamors to be heard when he or she feels left out or unnoticed. Inside, clamor is a feeling of of frustration. Have we ever witnessed restless, restlessness in, in some of our brothers and sisters? Always moving, disruptive, all, making noise, make noise, shouting, it, but it disrupts. It disrupts. Why? Be, be, because this person feels that they're being left out. Or they're being unnoticed. And inside they feel frustrated. Those people are never satisfied. See, see, this is this is the trick of the enemy. Here's the trick. And I'm gonna get well, let me finish the sentence. Those people are never satisfied, never at peace with themselves, always seem to be stirring the pot bringing up past hurts, nagging for more, or agitating for someone else, something else, not necessarily better, just different. These are some of the signs of a clamorous spirit. Clamor is the opposite of being content. And so Paul teaches us in Philippians 4 and 11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Never satisfied. Never satisfied. You see, here's what happens, and, and many of you, many of you have witnessed this, and maybe before the Lord, maybe before you matured, you found yourself grieving the Holy Spirit in this area, that no matter what, what was given to you, thinking it would cause the restlessness to go away, it didn't, because you're never satisfied, never at peace with ourselves. Always stirring the pot. You ever, you ever see some people? You ever see some, some folks? They're always they're always stirring up something. They, they'll they'll go back they'll go back to the founding pastor a hundred years ago <laughs> and stir the pot because Pastor Pettis he's a good teacher but he's not teaching like 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 his dad did and like Uncle Albert. You remember Great Uncle Albert? bringing up past hurts, nagging for more, agitating for something else, not necessarily better, just different. As we look around today, we see this clamorous spirit. We see it in our churches. The service isn't any better, it's just different. Let's continue. The next that grieves the Holy Spirit is evil speaking. Injuring another person's good name, slandering or uttering a defamatory statement or report. We may explode, lashing out at others close to us and even those we 
love deeply. Eventually, evil speaking will keep a believer from thinking thoughts of Christ and witnessing to the love of Christ. We can speak evil to the extent that we, we no longer become an effective witness to the kingdom. People have heard you run other people down so much. Yeah. So when, when you get up to speak, or to testify, whatever, they say, eh, he really speaks evil. She really speaks evil. And eventually, it will keep a believer from even thinking the thoughts of Christ and witnessing to the love of Christ. This this is a this is a major one. This is a major one and and it comes over from before we were saved. This is this is where the transformation and the renewing of their mind th these six things we have to turn them over to the Lord. And so, it, Lord, give me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. Malice, to be motivated by hatred. Normally, we speak of malice in terms of prejudice. It is the ultimate in moral inferiority and decay because it is the exact opposite of love. It doesn't have to be racial. You can hate someone in your family, a, a blood relative, but it's the exact opposite of love. Malice is at the root of disharmony. Malice is contrary to the very nature of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot manifest itself where hatred exists because the foremost fruit of the Holy Spirit is love. So let's continue. Let's continue. Now that, now that we've seen those six areas where we grieve the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit has told us the Holy Spirit that says, no, I want you to walk in the Spirit. And I'm going to show you these areas. So now let's walk in love. I there, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ hath loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. Ephesians 5, 1 and 2. When we speak about walking in love, here's the challenge. Do we love in our own strength, or do we love as Christ loved? I'll repeat it. Do we love in our own strength or do we love as Christ loved? Do we walk, talk, think, and behave like Jesus? As believers in Jesus Christ, we are God's children, spiritually speaking. We are his direct offspring. So we should strive to walk like our father. We are his children, so walk like him. Bishop Jakes in the book, he, he uses the example of the child mimicking their parents or their father's walk. 
I remember even when I was a child, uh, I, I used to try to mimic the way my dad would walk or, or, you know, the way he combed his hair. And even as I became a young man, I still wanted to shave the way dad. Yeah, yeah. we have to walk the way Jesus walks. Believers who extend, here it is, you ready? Grace and compassion. Believers who are ex who extend grace and compassion are imitated Jesus as much as those who seek to raise the dead or multiply fish and bread to feed the multitude. Jesus' ministry on earth was marked by spectacular displays and power as well as spectacular displays of love. Ultimately, our walk, ultimately, our walk is going to be a manifestation of love. What happens oftentimes is we want the miracle. We, we, want, we want to lay hands and eyes open. We yeah, we we want to to speak. We want to 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 speak voluminous words. We we want to, you know, we want to do all of that huh, to show that we're walking in love. But are we walking in grace and compassion? You you see, you see, gr grace and compassion. Is, is, is as much, as great as the fishes and loaves, feeding 5,000, grace and compassion, just as great, just as great. And you know what the scriptures teach us? By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, not that you raise the dead. No, no, no. But that you have love one for the other. Grace and compassion. Let's continue. I, I told you it was so much. I, I tried to share that with you. This lesson is so much. And please, if you haven't gotten your copy, if you haven't gotten your copy of Bishop Jake's text, please get your copy and take your time and read through it. Take your time and read through it. Prayerfully asking God to touch your heart that it doesn't become hardened and that you do what we, we often do. Well, that's his opinion. Let the word, let the word work. Let the word work. Let's continue. Walk in love. For this is the message ye have heard from the beginning, that ye should love one another. We know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. My little children, let us not love in word, <laughs> neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. 1 John 3, 11, 14, and 18. Our challenge is to walk through every day in such a way that we reflect the love walk of Jesus. Every day. Every day, Pastor? Every day. But I, I don't feel like it. What makes us think that Jesus felt like it every day? The Bible says that Jesus did what his father told him to do. I, I know, do, do, do we really think that Jesus wanted to die up on that cross? Every day we've got, every day we've got to reflect the love. He went on that cross because of love. He, you know, he stayed, let's do that, on that cross because of love. Love people the way Jesus loved us and, and the way he loves. Pastor uh, CJ in Martinsville, Martinsburg, he has a sign. His, his church is called the House of Purpose. 
And it says, love God and love people. Let's continue. And so here's the sacrifice. Here's the sacrifice. Ephesians 5 and 2 tells us that the sacrifices we make in love are a sweet smelling savor to God. God delights in our expre expressions of love to other people. God delights in our expressions of love other people. We give him pleasure. We give God pleasure through our acts of genuine, not phony, <laughs> not pretentious, but our genuine Christ-like love. But it isn't easy to love like that. Oh, I'm so glad you said that, Pastor Pettis. I was wondering when you were going to get to that point. It isn't easy to love like that. He calls such love a sacrifice, something we must choose to do willfully and consistently. And it goes against our fleshly nature. Just as we choose to sin, we can choose to love. Just as sin goes against our spiritual nature, love goes against our fleshly nature, and it is a sacrifice. We have to choose to empty ourselves, <laughs> oh God, on behalf of others. Now, now see, that, 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 that group of us that's a, that has selfish issues, now you know now you talk about sacrifice. We have to choose to empty ourselves on the behalf of others. We have to choose to die to self so we can love others more genuinely. To be loving, we must choose the cross. We cannot walk in love if we do not choose the cross. Love is an action word. Walking in love and holiness is not automatic with conversion. I love the song. I used to sing it. Years ago, looked at my hands and my hands looked new. Looked at my feet and they did too. Started running and I had a new walk. Started talking and I had a new talk. Our actions are still subject to our will and they are the outcome of choices that we make. If more acts of the past are forgiven, but salvation is not an automatic vaccination against all immoral acts in the future. We must pray, we must pray for guidance of the Holy Spirit in everything we think, we say, and we do. Proverbs 3, I believe, 5 and 6. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he will direct thy path. At the same time, we must seek to have our minds renewed by the word of God. Without the enlightenment and discipline, uh-oh, discipline? But I thought I had liberty. You do. You have the liberty to be disciplined. <laughs> the liberty to be disciplined that comes from God's word and the Holy Spirit. No believer can be trained in godly behaviors of which love is the highest. Uh, this, this, is, this is the action word. 
that this is the part of walking in love that that comes off of the page and becomes alive. And so let's, for a few minutes, let's walk in wisdom. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be ye not therefore partakers with them. Ephesians 5, 6, and 7. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For well, the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. 1 Corinthians 3, 18 and 19. Let's walk in wisdom. Are there certain types of sin and disobedience that are either acceptable or doesn't matter to God. Now just think about it. I, I know I know we, we quickly want to answer that, but let's just think about it. Are there certain types of sin and disobedience that are either acceptable but it doesn't matter to God? Does a white lie matter to God? Does Ah, oh, come on. Does eating fruit in the grocery store, does that matter to God? Really? I mean, okay. I'm not talking about grapes. Well, yes, I am. <laughs> but, you know, can I grab an apple and just walk down the aisle and say, well, no, I'm not going to let the grocer know and I'm not going to pay. Does that matter to God? This is a way, this is a Greek way of thinking. They believed and taught that they could do anything they wanted in their bodies because the body didn't really matter. Only the spirit mattered. Can, can, I, can, I, can I stare at a young lady going down the street, dress a little tight and maybe cut a little up? Can I just sit and stare? Mm. It didn't matter to the Greeks because they believed that they could do anything with their bodies because to them, the only thing that mattered was the spirit. And so let's see what the scripture says. It says, know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. What do we have to do? We have to be the light. Come on, let's be the light. Let's level up. When we choose to sin or act upon man's wisdom, we deny the Holy Spirit any opportunity to work through us. Here is the standard. Here's the standard. Look to what is good. Look to what is right. And look to what is true. The Holy Ghost will always produce fruit that is marked by goodness, righteousness, and truthfulness. Apostle Paul, he goes on to serve some more spiritual meat to the Ephesians church. You, you would think by now they're saying, "Wow, you, you, you've given me the six, you've given me these, these six things that I, I I have to overcome, and now you're now you've got me walking in the light, and 
And and and and and now there's still more. And he yes, there's still more. He says we are to avoid sinning. We are not to seek out, go along with, party with, or associate routinely with sinful activities of unbelievers. Wow. Paul, come on. Come, come, Paul, is it that tight? When you're walking in the spirit, that's the liberty you have. We are to have absolutely no ties with sin. Slam my Bible shut. God bless you, Pastor Pettis. And I might come back next week. But trust me, when you open your Bible back up, you will find, just as I have done and shared with you, the very same verses of Scripture. Huh. Okay. You asked for it. And having no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doeth make manifest is light. Ephesians 5, 11 through 13. We are not to dismiss sin or attempt to justify it either in ourselves or in others. We are to reprove sin. Well, she's just a little weak in that area. Well, yeah, well, you know, Bishop, you know, Pastor Pettis, before he got saved, you know, he liked that, he liked that, that those spirits, he, you know, he liked that scotch, so... You know, we pray for, no, 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 don't justify it. Don't, don't justify it. No, no. No fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. We are to display the love and righteousness of God. There is nothing wrong. Please get this. There is nothing wrong with working, resting, playing, and growing. And certainly the word of God encourages us to do these things. There is a simple prescription for a healthy, happy, fulfilling, and successful Christian walk. And yet most of us spend most of our times doing something else. In order to be filled with the Spirit, we must speak to ourselves. We must speak the right things, psalms, hymns, and spiritual psalms. We must make melody in our hearts, praising and worshiping God. We're going to come back, but I want to read that again now. I want to read that again. In order to be filled with the Spirit, we must speak to ourselves. That's number one. We, we, we talk to everybody else. Now let's speak to ourselves. And we must speak the right things. So, so what am I saying to myself? What I can't do, that's against scripture. Because I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. No, I have to speak the right things. I have to speak psalms, hymns, and spiritual psalms. We must make melody in our hearts, praising and worshiping the Lord at all times. In our walk in wisdom, be not drunk with wine, wherein it is access, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, Ephesians 5.18. And, and the author, 
he he really he he really he he, uh, he hones in on this because we get caught on this here being drunk with wine. We get oh my God, some of you some of you when I read that you got caught right there. Yeah, the Bible says don't be. But the enemy causes us to miss verse nineteen, the speaking to ourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing and making melody in our heart to the Lord. How do we know whether or not we're walking in the wisdom and understanding of God? How do we know? When our spirit-filled heart is making melody unto the Lord, you are plugged in to wisdom itself. Oh, this is so simple. This is so simple. When our spirit-filled heart is making melody unto the Lord, we are plugged into wisdom itself. The good news is that if we get off track in one moment of time, we can be right back on track by simply repenting, turning our heart back to God, and beginning, here it is, to sing the songs, the hymns, and the spiritual songs to him. God bless you. God bless you. Abundant life, abundant living, abundant living. Abundant living requires that we walk in love, requires that we walk in the spirit, and it requires that we walk in wisdom. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for this lesson. I thank you, Father, that we did not let the enemy win. We, we continued, we persevered, and whoever you meant for this word to strengthen, we thank you. I, I thank you because this word was meant to strengthen your son, your, your son. Yes, God, yes. I thank you. I thank you. I, I thank you for that this word is a convicting word, but not a condemning word. Convi oh, I thank you that it convicts, but it doesn't condemn. I thank you. I thank you for the grace. I thank you for the compassion, Lord, of this lesson. For, for your sons and daughters to live the abundant life. Oh, the devil hates it, Lord. He hates the very idea of us doing it. But you, you, you had Paul... You had Paul right to the church at Ephesus. And now here we are 2,000 years later. And we're still walking, hallelujah, in the abundant life that you promised us. Now, Lord, I ask that you look down on the sinner. Those that heard this word today and the word convicted their heart, cause them to seek you, Father. Cause them to say, I want to be saved. I want to. What must I do to be saved? Hmm. Look down on the backslider. Cause him to come back home. Come on back home. You don't have to stay out there. You don't have to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. But come on back home. Do this. We give your name all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If the Lord has touched your heart and you want to receive him into your life, I invite you to go to our website, eveninglightchurch.org, eveninglightchurch.org, and just touch on the tab that says beliefs. And right there, you will see the biblical plan of salvation. The biblical plan. God bless you. Those that want to make a donation, online, cash app, dollar sign, LCOM12. PayPal, Evening Light Church of Christ, GiveLify.com, Evening Light Church of Christ. Or you can mail it to Post Office Box 4854, Upper Marlboro, Maryland. 
and I'm inviting you. The Lord has blessed us. We're back in the tent of meeting. So I'm inviting you to come worship with us on Sundays at 10 o'clock a.m. here in the East. Come on, let's worship together in the beauty of holiness. God bless you. Till next week, at the same time, if it be the Lord's will, continue to pray for Pastor Alton and Sister Doretha that we do the Lord's work in this last day. In Jesus' name, God bless you.